Well, welcome home. It always feels good when we take a journey away to come back home, doesn't it? Amen. The context of our Ketavei Hashlachim portion from Acts 24, which is what I'm going to focus on today, is the final days of Rabbi Shaul. In fact, if you'd like have your scriptures ready, I'm going to be drawing primarily from Acts 24, verses 1, probably all the way through 22, 23, 24, probably the whole, the whole chapter. Acts 24. I'm certain that all of you have brought your swords this morning. Rabbi Shaul has spent many years establishing and strengthening congregations that would eventually have huge opportunities to share the contagious good news of Yeshua HaMashiach, which would massively change people's lives and understanding of God in the first century. And as we learned from Rabbi Shaul last Shabbat, God's word cannot be chained. God's word cannot be chained. Amen? Now, Rabbi Shaul was entering Jerusalem having compelled, being compelled by the Ruach HaKodesh of the Holy Spirit to be there, to go there. And on his journey there, he brought along gifts that he had collected from the predominantly Gentile congregations to help in the needs of the Jerusalem Kehilat due to a, a famine that existed in that region. But upon his arrival, nothing went the way that he had hoped. Isn't that the way it seems sometimes? It, you, you have an agenda, something you, you intend to do, and you start out doing whatever it is, and it never works out. Well, not never, but sometimes it just doesn't work out the way you had planned. Amen? Yeah. Anybody ever experienced that? Yeah. Sure, multiple times. So rather than what he had intended to happen, there was a mob there who sought to kill him, which caused the Romans then to intervene and arrest him and put him through a series of trials in the Roman court system. His first trial took place before the religious leaders of the Sanhedrin. And it would be like, it would be kind of like um, if I was part of a denomination uh, and I'm called, it'd be like being called before the board or the, or the heads of the particular denomination to give account to uh, and accusations that have been made against me regarding what I may have done or what I may have not done or what I may have taught or what I may not have taught. That's really what Rabbi Shul was experiencing initially from the Sanhedrin. Now, when that didn't produce the desired results that they were hoping for, Rabbi Shul was then taken to a higher court, to a Roman court, which is what we're going to be reading about today in Acts 24. Now, the Roman governor at the time was Felix. And he was given the task of reviewing the reports and deciding whether Rabbi Shul was innocent or guilty of what his future would be and what his future would be. Now, these court cases are chronicled uh, through the next couple chapters of Acts. And eventually, Shaul, or Paul, would make his way to Rome to what amounts to a Roman supreme court, which is standing before Caesar himself. And... What's going to happen is he's going to be convicted. And he's going to be convicted of having and serving only one king, and that is Yeshua HaMashiach. And I stand convicted as well. I serve only one king. Amen? Amen. Now Yeshua himself told Shaul when he was in jail in Jerusalem that he would definitely stand on trial before judges and rulers and that he should not be afraid. And we'll see. Shaul did indeed stand boldly before Felix. And he demonstrated to us what it means to live with integrity. When you're put on the spot, when the heat is on, will you stand with integrity? That's what he demonstrated for us. Amen? Amen. To be able to stand before your accusers, to stand with confidence. See, integrity sometimes stands confident in one's innocence. If you know you're innocent, you can stand confidently. You have nothing that you really care about. 
But it also allows us to humbly confess our sins, and that's what we need to do as well. But integrity also seeks to make things right if we've wronged someone. But when we are falsely accused, integrity stands tall, which is what Shaul demonstrates for us in today's portion. Now, in Acts 24, 16, Rabbi Shaul explained how he took great pains to have a good conscience. Good conscience before God and man. And that's integrity. And Shaul wanted to be a person of integrity. He, that's what he wanted in his life. It wasn't about his gifts, which he had numerous, or his abilities, which he, was, he had achieved much in his lifetime today. It wasn't the gifts and abilities that got him where he was in life. It was his effort, his effort, to always do the right thing at the right time and in the right place. No matter what the circumstances or, you know, were at the time. We can think it was his gifts. We can think that it was his unique abilities. But Luke is telling us that would be selling Rabbi Shaul very short. See, for Rabbi Shaul, it was hard work. It was hard work to live a life of integrity that allowed his gifts and abilities to be seen by others. This morning, we're going to look at the work we have to do to do the same. The work that we have to do to live like Rabbi Shaul did, a life of integrity. No amount of gifting, no amount of abilities are going to take the place, brothers and sisters, of hard work that is required in our decision to apply ourselves to that goal. So it takes hard work and it takes commitment to that hard work. Amen? Amen. Now we talked about, we talked about integrity, and a lot of people do. But do we really know what it is? What really is integrity? Integrity comes from a word that speaks of wholeness. The person of integrity lives, first of all, rightly. He's not divided or she's not divided in the sense that they're one person in one circumstance and somebody else in another circumstance. Amen? You know people like that, and we've been people like that at times. A person of integrity chooses courage over comfort because sometimes it takes a great amount of courage to stand with integrity. They choose what is right over what is fun or what is fast or what is easy. It's choosing to practice our values rather than simply just professing them or talking about them. Our world, brothers and sisters, I, don't, I think I'm preaching to the choir here. Do we have a choir? No. <laughs> Good. But uh, our world, brothers and sisters, is very light in the arena of integrity. We see it so much, example, in the political uh, theater of, of late. But where Rabbi Shul says, we need to take great pains so this life of integrity can be seen not only by God, but also by others. And there are, in our portion today, three main characters that I want to uh, uh, illuminate. Uh, the first, of course, is Rabbi Shaul, the central character. Luke, the author of Acts, will paint him in a way that shows that he was clearly a man of integrity. He's our model. He represents what we're shooting for. Even Paul said that, you know, do as I do. He was definitely a man of integrity. And we need to imitate him. We need to imitate him. And then we're going to read about a man named Tertullus. Tertullus is a Roman lawyer with zero integrity. Right? Zero integrity. We're going to see how that lack of integrity on his part is lived out. And then finally we're going to see how Felix the governor, who also lacked integrity. And that allows Luke to sort of set up a comparison for us. Now we live in a world where we're called to live like Rabbi Shaul amidst people like Tertullus and Felix. We're surrounded by Tertullus and Felix. My main point today is that a life of integrity is witnessed in our way. And what way is that? The way we talk, but the way we walk as well. So first of all, I want to address the area of talk. Integrity is found in the way that we talk. And I'm going to read, if you have your, your verse, your scriptures there, 
I'd like to read from 24 verses 1 to 9. I'm reading from the complete Jewish Bible. It's a translation I use. Other translations will be pretty darn similar, but I like how the complete Jewish Bible uses the original language. Verses 1 to 9. And if you have, if you want to read along with me, that'd be great. After five days, the Kohen Haggadol Hananiah came down with some elders and a lawyer named Tertullus. And they presented their case against Shaul to the governor. Shaul was called and Tertullus began to make the charges. Felix, your excellency, it is because of you that we enjoy unbroken peace. And it is your foresight that has brought to this nation so many reforms in so many areas. It's with the utmost gratitude that we receive this. But in order not to take up too much of your time, I beg your indulgence to give us a brief hearing. We have found this man a pest. We found him a pest. Literally in Hebrew, a plague. They considered him a plague. He is an agitator among all the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarene. He even tried to profane the temple, but we arrested him. We wanted to try him under our own law, but Lysias, the commander, intervened. He took him out of our hands by force and ordered his accuser to appear before you. By questioning this man yourself, you will be able to learn all about the things of which we are accusing him. The Judeans also joined in the accusation and alleged that these were the facts. So, Rabbi Shaul has been taken north from Jerusalem or Jerusalem to Caesarea by about 470 armed guards. One guy, 470 guards. He was really tough. Caesarea was the county seat, if you may, he, of Judea, its provincial center. We know that because the city was named after Caesar, which meant that Rome had established it as a regional headquarters. Uh, it held the courthouse, and it was the bastion of the highest Roman officials and military. In Caesarea, Paul or Shabbat Shaul was brought before the provincial governor named Felix. But before we look at him, we need to see that the Jews saw an opportunity. They saw an opportunity to finish what they had started in Jerusalem. There, Shaul had stood before the Sanhedrin, and in the process of their interrogation, a mob scene broke out, which caused the Romans to step up and, of course, take charge of the situation. And this kept Shaul from being held by the Jewish authorities for crimes that he didn't commit. And when they knew Shaul had been taken to Caesarea, his accusers, of course, followed along. And when his case was brought before Felix, the Jewish leaders brought someone who spoke Roman. And that is, they wanted some to represent them who understood Roman culture, Roman thought, Roman values, Roman law, of course. And of course, somebody who might have a little bit of favor with Governor Felix. So they chose a, an order named Tertullus, and we know very little about this man, but here's what we do know. The name Tertullus literally means a lying imposter. That's what it literally means. Now, I'm, I'm pretty certain that as they were looking at this cute little newborn baby, they didn't say, you know what, we should name him lying imposter. I'm just not quite certain that's really how that happened. But I, I, I will say this. It's most likely that it was a name given to him from his skill and conniving as a lawyer. So I think that's really where that name came from. And I, now, I, I personally, I've been so blessed with some very good men that have represented me. But there are others like those lying in wait to bring lawsuit after lawsuit to take financial advantage of this Chinese virus. A lot of lawyers are lined up ready to go to file lawsuits. Now, but this lawyer, Tertullus, appears to be the sort who is quick to do whatever he needs to do to make a case go his way. 
He's more about winning the case than he is about justice in the case. Amen? So instead of litigating facts, which should happen in the courtroom, he had a different strategy. His strategy is to encourage Felix to let Rabbi Shalom make his own case. Let him talk. Let him say whatever he wants because he's probably going to incriminate himself. And that's pretty much what he was hoping for. Bring in the defendant. Let him talk. And from his words, we're going to, we're going to hear that we were right. He is a problem. He is a play. So the first point I want to make this morning in regards to our talk is our talk must be void of flattery. Must be void of flattery. Notice that Tertullus, that's where he starts right away with Felix. He starts out with flattery. Let me read that to you. As he's given a chance to speak, what does he say to Felix? His very first words out of his mouth are, Felix, your excellency, it is because of you that we enjoy unbroken peace, and it is your foresight that has brought to this nation so many reforms in so many areas. It is with the utmost gratitude that we receive this, your excellent one. Pretty schmaltzy, but Tertullus uses his opening statement basically to suck up. He's sucking up to the governor with the, the flattery. But it doesn't take much to figure out that it really doesn't have much respect for Felix. He doesn't. It, nor does Felix deserve any of this flattery. Let me make my point. First, if Felix had brought the nation unbroken peace, well, why did he need 470 men to escort Rabbi Shaul, one prisoner from Jerusalem to Caesarea? Is there unbroken peace that requires 470 armed guards? Secondly, if Felix has brought to his nation so many reforms in so many areas, which has resulted in so much prosperity, why is Shaul bringing alms? Why is he bringing alms to believers in Jerusalem? Alms are for poor people. Is the economy so good that we require alms? And finally, he calls him Felix, your excellency. Really? Do a little homework on uh, Felix, and you're going to find out something. One secular historian states that Felix was born a slave. He was born a slave. The reason he got his appointment as governor was that his brother befriended a young boy who eventually became Claudius Caesar. He got the position through connections, not through performance. The Roman historian uh, Tacitus tells us Felix governed in Judea from 52 to 60 A.D., about eight years. And according to this historian, this Roman historian, the power of a king, but the mind of a slave. See, Felix had a reputation. He had, he had a reputation of being corrupt. He had a reputation for being cruel. And certainly had a reputation for his lust. And, you know, in all fairness, that's prevalent with a lot of politicians these days, is it not? But we're told that his wife, Drusilla, whom we learn about in a moment, was married to her first husband until the lusty Felix checked her out and enticed her away from her husband, after which Felix took her as his third wife. And she was first married when she was about 16, so then on 18, she's into her second marriage. So she's been a busy young lady. So obviously, Tertullus, flattery of Felix was undeserved, and probably nobody really believed it anyway, except perhaps Felix himself, because he was all about himself. He was, uh, yeah, he was pretty self-absorbed. Now I see in Luke's account an important lesson about flattery which is the act of giving excessive compliments with an agenda. For, of, of ingratiating yourself with the object of your desires or wants. Now the difference between flattery and a compliment is important. You need to be able to discern the difference. There's nothing wrong with paying someone a compliment. Nothing wrong with that whatsoever. Where a compliment becomes flattery if when one hopes to gain approval or some sort of advantage from the person being flattered. Tertullus 
wanted something. <laughs> he wanted something from Felix, so he was definitely stroking his ego. Every time the Bible speaks about flattery, our brothers and sisters, it's never in a positive context. Someone has said once that flattery is sweet-smelling lies used to manipulate another for personal gain. So behold flattery. Now, if you read Proverbs, for example, I try to read it every day, there are two ways that flattery is described in Proverbs. First, flattery is attached to lust. In the sense that an adulterer will use flattering words to gain what the flatterer want, or what he wants. And uh, Proverbs calls these words poisonous. This is how it works. A guy or a girl seeks to get farther with another person for the sake of selfish pleasures. That's flattery. Because you are after something. Second, Proverbs speaks of flattery being used in the workplace. It's usually by an employee to gain favor with the employer. A person might say, oh, sir, you're the best boss I've ever had. You're the best boss in the world. You're, you, you're so smart. I, I am so blessed to work here. Thank you so much for hiring me. Every day when I come to work, I thank God I get to work for you. How many of you guys have said that to your boss? Inside, the person is, <laughs> some people do mean it, but inside, that person is vomiting, he really thinks his boss is an idiot. A person carries favor with the boss in order to manipulate them into maybe a promotion or a raise or an opportunity. Shaul spoke of a flattery a couple times in Romans, but he especially addressed it in 1 Thessalonians 2.5. Regarding his ministry, Rabbi Shul said this, For as you know, never, never did we employ flattering talk. Didn't go there. Nor did we put on a false front to mask greed. God is witness to what I'm saying. Yeshua spoke in front of all kinds of people. He, he never flattered them. Do you see the word in Scripture where Yeshua was flattering anybody? No. No. He stood before Pontius Pilate. He didn't flatter him. He spoke the truth to Pontius Pilate. He spoke it in love, and we need to do that as well. But integrity in speech will always be devoid of flattery. So we want to shun flattery in our, speak, in our speech, but we also need to stand firm on our convictions. Stand firm. See, to review our account, Shalul spent seven days in Jerusalem. Then for five days, he's been in the custody of the Romans in Judea. He was compelled by the Ruach HaKodesh of the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem where he brought offerings from the Gentile congregation to the believers while they were suffering in a famine. Then the Jews accused him of being against Torah. So they were skeptical about this good news or this gospel that he was preaching about. Shaul told them, that, no, I am loyal. I am loyal to the Tanakh. And later he said he did everything according to scripture. But Rushalayim Zachanin, or the Jerusalem elders, still told him to prove his loyalty to the Torah by joining four other men by taking a Nazarite vow in the temple and even paying their way. So Shaul, he said, okay. He, he purified himself. He went to the temple for seven days. To, it not only didn't help, it actually seemed to make things worse, quite frankly. While he was in the temple, a rumor was started that he had brought Gentiles into the temple because they were unclean. They did not live uh, a Torah lifestyle, so they were ceremonially unclean. So Shaul was dragged out of the temple by a mob who began to beat him, at which point the Romans had to step in and, and save his tokus from being beat to death. And he was brought before the Sanhedrin, then before the Romans, where he was accused of being this ringleader who was a blasphemer and also responsible for inciting riots and accusation. So we read from verse 5 from Acts 24, We have found this man a pest. He is an agitator among the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarene. Now, I don't know what kind of week you guys have been having. It hasn't been especially a wonderful month for that matter. But I imagine very few of us have been called a plague. We might have been dealing with a plague. We haven't been called a plague. Tertullus 
his accusations were then confirmed by the other Jews who said, oh yeah, that's true. Well, he's, yeah, that's right. Yeah, what he says is true. Yeah. And we need to understand that you and I will be accused of things in difficult circumstances. There's nobody here that hasn't been accused of something. Accused of something. But what do we see from Paul's example? What does Rabbi Shaul do? Did he get defensive? No. Does he swear or curse or get angry? No. Does he lose his temper? Act emotionally? No. Not at all. He's never out of control. The example teaches us something. It teaches us that when we are falsely accused, we don't have to lose our minds in the process. We don't have to, you know, come unglued because of it. We need to simply stand firm in the confidence that we are right before God and before men. Just that simple. I could tell a story, but I'm not going to. But I know what that feels like. That's the key. Is if you, the accusations are false, you stand firm. You don't have to lose your mind. You don't have to get emotional. You don't have to get defensive. You don't have to get angry. You don't have to get violent. The truth is on your side. So you just stand firm on the truth. Rabbi Shul does not speak until he receives permission. He doesn't interrupt. He doesn't have to have his voice heard. He just waits his turn. Now, you have to admit, if somebody's accusing you of something and ranting in, in, in court of public opinion or court, it's hard. It's hard to sit there and hear that. But that's what he does. He sits and listens to it. Could you do it? Could you remain silent while somebody is just spewing lies about you? Think of how hard that is. And especially those lies might cost you your life. So where do you think that Paul learned to keep his cool? Where do you think Paul learned to stay silent? Yeshua said he placed himself in the hands of the one who judges correctly. So, so does Rabbi Shaul. And so should we. Amen? Shaul knew he hadn't done anything wrong. He didn't do nothing wrong. So until he was given the opportunity to speak, he remained firm, quiet. Far too many of us would lose the high ground in a situation when we're falsely accused because we get emotional. That's proving to the people that their false accusations maybe has some merit. Why is he so defensive? Maybe it's true. Right? So stand firm. Shun flattery. And then, as I already implied here just a minute ago, you need to state the facts. What does Rabbi Shalom do when he's given permission to speak? Exactly. He states the facts. That's why courtrooms are so wonderful. Because just show me the evidence. Show me the facts. If you want to speak with integrity when you're given the opportunity, that's all you need to do. Just state the facts. Acts 24.10. When the governor motioned for Shalom to speak, he replied, I know that you have been judged over the nation for a number of years, so I am glad to make my defense. There's no flattery there. There's no hyperbole. There's no exaggeration. He just says, I'm ready to make my case, to state my facts. And that's what he does. <clears throat> From verses 12 to 21. As you can verify for yourself, says Rabbi Shalom, it has not been more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem. And neither in the temple nor in the synagogue nor anywhere else in the city did they find me either arguing with anyone or collecting a crowd. Nor can they give any proof of the things which they are accusing me. No proof. But this I do admit to you. I worship the God of our fathers in accordance with the way. And that was the way of Yeshua. I continue to believe everything that accords with the Torah and everything written in the prophets. Now, I don't hear that scripture quoted very much in the modern contemporary church in regards to Rabbi Shaul or Paul doing away with the word of God or the Torah or the law. According to him, he says, I, I believe everything that accords with the Torah and everything written in the prophets. And I continue to have a hope in God, which they too accept. 
And there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the unrighteous. Indeed, it is because of this that I make a point, I make a point of always having a clear conscience in the sight of both God and men. And after his absence of several years, I came to Jerusalem to bring a charitable gift to my nation and to offer sacrifices. I, it was in connection with the latter that they found me in the temple. I had been ceremonially purified. I was not with a crowd, and I was not causing a disturbance. But some Jews from the province of Asia, they ought to be here before you, you to make a charge if they have anything against me, but, or else let these men themselves say what crime they found me guilty of when I stood in front of the Sanhedrin. Other than this one thing which I shouted out when I was standing among them, I am on trial before you today because I believe in the resurrection of the dead. So what are the facts? What are the facts? Well, first, Shaul had been, only been in Jerusalem for seven days. Seven days, one week. It seems kind of hard that in seven days you start a whole movement. <laughs> you know, seven days to create a mob that would follow and produce civil unrest in Jerusalem. I mean, he didn't have social media then. <laughs> he could, like, post it on Facebook and everybody comes together. <laughs> it's just not enough time to start a riot. Secondly, he told them he went up to the temple to purify himself and make offerings. That doesn't sound like a person who has a beef with the temple or wants to desecrate the temple. You don't come to worship and bring offerings to the temple if you're going to desecrate it. You might want to vandalize it, <laughs> But Shaul doesn't do anything like that. He enters into a faithful practice with others in the temple. And finally, in response to being accused of being a ringleader of the Nazarene sect, Shaul said, he actually was part of the sect. <laughs> I am part of the sect called the Way. The Way is a group that worshiped the God of their fathers and fully revered the Torah. You know, followers of Yeshua in that day, believe it or not, were more often referred to as the way than Christian. You'll find very few references in, in, in Scripture of, of Christian. There's only a couple references. Most references to people who follow Yeshua were people of the way. Now, when we're accused, if you lose our minds and emotions, then you lose the moral high ground. And you want to have the high ground. Somebody once said, never get in a fight with a pig. Never get in a fight with a pig. What does that mean? Essentially what you're saying is if you get in a fight with a pig, you're both going to get dirty. And the pig will enjoy that. You come down to the pig's level. You understand? Pig wallows in the mud. It's very lowly to the ground. Very sloppy. Very messy. Very unclean. There are people out there who love to get dirty. They love to pull others down low in the mud with them. When we allow ourselves to get into a fight with them, we're going to get dirty, and they're all happy about it. When someone comes to break up a fight, what are they going to find? They're going to find two dirty people. Don't get in a fight with a pig. Now, there are people in your workplace, or maybe even in your home or community, who love to start fights and accuse you of things just to incite you to join them in the mud. You need to stay out of the mud. Do what Rabbi Shaul did. State the facts. Just keep to the, just the facts, man. Just give them the facts. So, integrity. We talked about integrity, the talk that you need to have for integrity. How we should talk. But it's also about how we walk the talk. Shaul demonstrated how we should shun flattery. How we should stand firm. How we should state the facts. But if we return to Acts 24 verse 16. And he says indeed it is because of this that I make a point of always having a. Something all you would like to have. A clear conscience. There's nothing better. My wife makes fun of me. She says. I said so. Uh, you know. I just sleep last night. She was. I was up all night, toss and turn, and I was thinking about this, that, and other. I go, well, what about me? She goes, <laughs> she goes, you, you, you're out, you're gone. You know, I go, well, yeah, because I have a clear conscience. I sleep well. 
I don't worry about anything. I don't concern myself about anything. I have a clear conscience. It's a wonderful thing to have. A nice, clean, clear conscience in the sight of both God, as Rabbi Shaul said, and men. A clear conscience was obviously important to Shaul. Brothers and sisters, it should be important to us. It should be very important to us. It's an important indication that we're living a life of integrity. Shaul was saying that his life of integrity wasn't just lived before other humans. It's also how he lived before God. Integrity, a walk of integrity, is also, also a very painstaking process. To live a life of integrity can be at times painful. Yes, painful. And there are two words in verse 16 of Acts 24 that stand out. First, there's the word that Rabbi Shul used, or at least the translation of the Greek, which says always. Our integrity isn't something we turn on and off based upon our circumstances. It can't be something that we have one day and not the next. Either you have integrity or you don't have integrity. It's not fluid <laughs> or, or, or subjective. Our integrity isn't something we have when, ah, I just feel like acting with integrity today. <laughs> it's who you are. Either we're a person of integrity or we're not a person of integrity. It's either or. There's, there's no middle ground, brothers and sisters. One thing I've learned is that integrity is really hard to develop and really easy to lose. You don't have to look very far to see godly people lose their integrity in a moment of passion, desire, want, compromise, it doesn't take much, brothers and sisters. It very easily can happen. And the second word to notice in verse 16, besides always, at least in the King James, it's cited this way, is exercise. Shaul says from the King James Version, I exercise myself always. I do my best in the new RSV. I make it a point in the complete Jewish Bible. Integrity requires hard work. It's not easy. It's not. It's not easy. How is a life of integrity made? Well, it's made through hundreds of daily decisions where we must choose between temptation and sin, obedience and holiness. Do you want to know if you're living a life of integrity? Does it matter to you? Are you yielding to the temptations of this world? Or are you compromising in any way? Are you, or are you choosing to obey God? You know, that if you read the opening verse of Proverbs, you go to Proverbs 1, uh, Proverbs 1. All these Proverbs are about what? Two things. Proverbs, all 31 Proverbs are about just two things. It says right at the beginning. Wisdom, discipline. You accomplish those two things, that's an essential. That's an essential. Amen? Joel said, I, I can stand before God and man. I can stand before God and man. Then I can see that I've lived a life of integrity. Thirdly, a walk of integrity is private, but it's also public. And we might ask ourselves, if I'm put on trial for integrity, what will people around me say? That's what happens at a funeral, right? What will people say about me when... You know, I'm in that cask or in the ground. Hopefully you guys have, are going to be in the ground in 24 hours, biblically. That's what I'm hoping for. I can preach it, but you've got to choose it. But what people are going to say in memorial? What are they going to say? Are they going to say, oh, yeah, he was a person, she was a person of integrity. Right? That's only part of it. So I told people that he made it a point to have a clear conscience first before God. And that's vertical, then before humankind, which is horizontal. So his first concern was with God. Where is God? It's right here. Where is the coronavirus? Everybody's concerned about that. Where is it at? Don't see it, but you know it's there, don't you? Same thing with God. You don't see him, but he's there. He's there. Right? Our integrity has two components. 
private integrity and public integrity. And, and speaking of private integrity, it's like, like I said, it's what we do before God. He sees and he knows everything. Even though we can hide our thoughts and actions from one another, you can never hide your thoughts and actions from God. Right? Like the scripture says, your sins will find you out. <laughs> right? Amen. Your sins will find you out. And so it begs the question, are you, you know, are you a person of integrity before our God? No one else can answer that question for you. I, I can't answer it. That's between you and the Lord. You see, we could take, we could fake it, I should say. We could fake integrity. We could fake it real well. We could fake it with everyone around us. Sometimes, we, some people are really good at it. But we need to ask God, how, how, how do you see me, God? How do you see me? You, you know what I'm thinking. You know what I'm doing when no one else is around. You know what my heart's desires are. You know what I'm wishing for and pursuing. I can fool others, but Lord, yeah, you know everything. I'm not fooling you. Shul said, I have a clear conscience before God. See, to have a clear conscience before God does not mean that we have to be perfect brothers and sisters. It's the pursuit of perfection that is perfect. But when we have done wrong before God, when we're convicted by the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, or confronted by someone else and realize that maybe we've done wrong, whether unintentional or intentional, then our response should be to agree that it was not right. And we need to make it right. We need to repent of it. First John, of Chapter 1, verse 9 tells us that when we confess our sins, God is faithful, what? To forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So God, in his infinite love and mercy, is willing to forgive us when we fail him and to give us a clear conscience before him. Do you have a clear conscience? Do you sleep well? I do. Do you? Secondly, about your public walk versus the private, the life you live in front of other people. We are told if we know that someone has something against us, we need to make it right before we share our gift at the altar. Right? We practice that in Yom Kippur, don't we? God doesn't hear your prayers until you make it right before humankind. So before it's, it's first got to be right before men and women in your life, and then you can come to God with your prayers and supplications. Some of us have issues, and some of us have struggles that we're holding against somebody. And you and I can't have a clear conscience before God and humankind if we're not continually seeking to live in harmony with one another. Yet we're going to offend each other. It's an inevitable, and some people are more easily offended than others, but offense will come. And we're going to wrong one another. Sometimes, you know, you have you do it intentionally. But sometimes, many times, you don't. But God tells us that before we come to the altar, you've got to go to that person. You've got to make it right. Don't speak words of flattery. Speak words of truth in love. Are we living with a good conscience for forgotten people? How did Shaul do this? I'm going to tell you how he did it. I'm going to give you five ways that he did it. How did he live with a good conscience before God and people. First of all, show examples for us that a life of integrity affirms the totality of Scripture. Not the pieces and parts that you like, and, and forget about the parts you don't like, the totality of Scripture. If we're going to live with integrity, we've got to affirm the totality of Scripture. We see how Shaul did this in Acts 24, verses 14 to 15. I'll read that for you. But this I do admit to you, I worship the God of our fathers in accordance with the way. I continue to believe everything in accordance with the Torah and everything written in the prophets. And I continue to have hope in God, which they too accept that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the unrighteous. It is valuable for us, brothers and sisters, to remember that Bad beliefs will always result in bad behavior. <laughs> Inappropriate beliefs or wrong beliefs will end up with wrong behavior. 
Whereas appropriate or right beliefs will lead you to good or right behavior. This is why Shaul told them, I believe what the scripture says. And we got people always challenging us on, on, on scripture as where well, that's right or that's, you know, I, I, I can go down a lot of roads right now. But I believe what the scripture says. I'm not going to challenge what the scripture says. I believe it. I'm not apologizing for that. I believe what God inspired in his word. And not just picking and choosing it again like what I said, but believing the word in its entirety. You and I will never live in obedience until we submit ourselves to the principles and standards therein of God's word. Secondly, not only affirming the totality of scripture, but a life of integrity has to be attracted to others. <laughs> You've got to be attracted to others. And we see this in verses 22 to 24 after the court session is all over. But Felix, who had rather detailed knowledge of things connected with the way, put them off, saying, when Lysias, the commander, comes down, I'll, then I'll decide your case. And then he ordered the captain to keep Shaul in custody, but to let him have considerable liberty and not prevent any of his friends from taking care of his needs. And after some days, Felix came with his wife, Priscilla, who was Jewish. And he sent for Shaul and listened to him as he spoke about trusting in the Messiah, Yeshua. The man with no integrity is interested in trusting in the Messiah, Yeshua, what that was all about. Why in the world would a Roman governor want to talk with a prisoner? Why would he want to do that? Wardens don't, <laughs> wardens don't hang out with prisoners. But Felix saw something in Shaul that attracted him, that drew him. Do you have that? 